Parce que... Endurance is known as the red plum in the Navy because it's a plum job. It's not a warship as such, and you can go to parts of the world that the rest of the Navy don't actually go to. We're a multi-role ship. A frigate would be crushed in the ice long before it could get anywhere near here. This is the Big Andy Show, brought to you by Radio Antarctica, broadcasting on 171 minutes from the library flat. We start with a request for George Kingshot from his wife and children, who are back in the UK, looking forward to his return. Hang on a minute, Bob. You've just got out of bed. Oh, I've been in here all morning. What would you like? I want two penguins, please. Big one and a little one. A big one and a little one? Yeah. How much is that? That's uh, £7 and eight pence to you, please, Bob. Hey, it's a small family and everybody helps each other. Such a small community, you've got to help each other. If, say, I want to get some stores from four decks below, I can just get them out of the store, forget about them, and before ten minutes, somebody's carried them up for me. The place is so impressive. It looks very tranquil, easy to get along with. You don't realise how dangerous it can be in turn from being beautiful one minute to being almost impossible to move in the next. Fantastic scenery, but it is probably the most dangerous area for a mariner in the world. It is dangerous because of the climatic changes, it's dangerous because of the ice, it's virtually uncharted. And if you take all those three things, and it makes even the most hardy mariner's hair stand on end, I would say. Hypothermia sets in very, very quickly. I reckon if, if somebody falls overboard here, depends how fit he is, depends how fat he is. But if he's a thin guy with not much arm, if we don't pick him up in four minutes, and the chances of us getting the ship round, it's really small. So don't fall overboard, it's not a good thing. No, if we get too far ahead, we just park on the ice and wait for Mother to catch up. Providing you land on a piece that's big enough and don't get too cold, it's no problem. We dress not for flying around in the cold weather, but we dress to fall in the water. You wear a suit which, on immersion, becomes waterproof. The electric stuff we wear, obviously, is for comfort. You're not conscious of frostbite. It creeps up on you. You know you're getting cold, but you don't know how cold you get. The temperature's down to minus 26. It saps you physically. We cold air whistling around your face means that we have to check each other for frostbite very regularly. That's my little pinkies that get cold. I think the pilots suffer from it more than the backseat too, because they have to sit in the same position for maybe five hours at a time, not really moving. But basically, you've got heated socks and heated gloves. They don't give an awful lot of heat. Because all the doors are off, and my hands get cold, it's very difficult to flick the switches and do whatever. If we're flying, say, 90 knots, it's difficult to estimate just how much wind is coming in through the door and at what speed. But I, I think 50 knots would be fair. You know, an air temperature of minus 16. And if you then put the wind chill factor in, it can be compared with driving a sports car in Alaska with the roof down. And we got the request coming in thick and fast. The next one is from Fletch and Charlie, the two LSAs who work for Tommy Scott. And their message for Tom is keep the 126s rolling in, Tom, because you're going to cost the ship's company a fortune. Right, look about five to six miles thick. Right, Johnson, look to the west of Penis Islands. That side is also fast to six feet. Aye, sir. Johnson, leads at all. None whatsoever. The sea down here is actually freezing quite hard. I'm just saying, it looks bloody cold. Absolutely. 
The icing is a great problem, especially if it blows over the back of the cockpit and goes into the engine. The Nimbus on the Wasp is not designed to eat ice. Spoil your whole day. That bay then is full of heavy pack. It stretches out four miles out of the sea from there. However, on the other side, it's well clear. There's pack, plenty of clear water. Uh, mother would have no problem getting down through there. One of the magic things about this engine is that we steam all the way down the 8,000 miles to Antarctica. It just trundles away quite merrily. It gets the good quality oil, it gets good filtered fuel, and it gets very well maintained. But even though it's an old engine, we're 26 years old now, it's still very reliable and it'll run forever. There's often a clear stretch of water between the pack ice and the Antarctic mainland. You've got to make the most of it. It only needs a change in the wind direction for the ice to drift somewhere else. You can never be sure down here. It's very unpredictable. There are several problems with navigating down in the Antarctic. The first one is icebergs. It's often very difficult to sort out icebergs from the snow-covered islands. And on the radar, often there are so many icebergs around 50 or 60 within the sort of five miles of the ship that the radar is just a mass of echoes. The weather, of course, very changeable. Um, one day it'll be clear, the next day it's blowing a gale with thick fog. We have to do our own forecasting. There's no one else down here. Here's the latest satellite chart. That's quite good, isn't it? That cold front that came through yesterday, that's really pushed off to the east. Mm. And this low cloud here, it's not on the uh, infrared chart at all. It seems to be following the Antarctic convergence. Mm. It looks like a bit of a sucker's gap, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll catch the flyers out on that one, I think. If you can't sort it out with them charts, try this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it never rains in here, does it? <laughs> see the Antarctic mainland for the first time. It's just amazing. I mean, if you used to wake up in the morning and just look out, you used to see the scenery, you think you're sort of on another planet, you know? You can never explain to anybody how beautiful it is, even when you show them pictures. I can't really describe it in words. It's the lost world. It's the place where... Volcanic rocks shooting out of the seabed. It's just a brilliant feeling, really, being part of it. If you've been here, you're one of a very small bunch. You don't go back to Rochdale and talk about the Antarctic and somebody says, oh, yes, I was there on my holidays last year. Someone had the bright idea of putting some of this Antarctic ice in Cokes and selling it. But it went down very well. They were selling Antarctic Cokes to the Chatham Navy Day visitors, I think, for 10p a cup. The kids loved it. Is it really from Antarctic? Is that why it's blue? Within an hour and a half of starting, we'd run out of the first block. And by the end of the two days, we'd make £25 profit for charity. There's always something going on for charity. This one, they've been training for weeks. It's a penny a pound. I'll be lifting over £300 in weight, which will be £3.18 off every member of the ship's company, which out of 120 men, it works out to a fair sum. When chaps are in the ice, they probably eat roughly twice as much as normal. We've got six deep freezes down below, and when we sail from Portsmouth, they are full right up to the door. You have to try and plan it by looking at your past expenditure. Now, this year, for example, we've used over 700 light bulbs. Last year, we only used 300, hence we're short. We've got none left now. We have to try and predict the things that are going to go wrong. An aircraft can fly around for months and be perfect, and all of a sudden, it goes, and when it goes, you're in trouble. To carry every item that a wasp would need while we're away, I'd need a storeroom twice as big as the one I've got now. The classic example to me is always toilet paper. If you run out of toilet paper in the middle of the Antarctic, you're stuck. What are you going to do? The water is clear. Over the years that endurance has run, a reserve of experience has built up which has been passed on through the successive flights because there's always an overlap of aircrew members. We're more fortunate than most in that with the flying, the ice reconnaissance, the vertical photography for making maps, penguin counts, we get away from the ship. has a, a great deal of variety and flying over the mountains, over the glaciers, which are quite fantastic. Most of them are crevassed to sort of depths of tens, if not hundreds of feet, which make just the sort of safety awareness of your flying that much more aware if you have an engine failure and there's nowhere really to go. But I don't think anyone who dwells on that sort of thought would be flying continuously anyway, so therefore you put it to the back of your mind and just get on with enjoying it. Mother's transit through western side. I see similar conditions considered mother's passage through the tail quite possible. Well, I mean, it's L44 over. Aircrew do get off the ship more, moving people or penguin counts. 
You can tell that since the whales have been reduced so much, there's more krill for the penguins. So the colonies have got bigger. The wildlife is fascinating. You can walk amongst the penguins, they're fantastic. And it's not like going to the zoo, it's totally different. And as long as you don't make any violent movements, so we'll just stay there, quite happy. But as far as the actual scenery goes, flying around, you can get a fantastic picture for maybe 100, 150 miles, all the icebergs, and you get quite a fantastic effect. You see icebergs there, maybe millions of years they've been sitting there. Oh, it's incredible, and it changes your ideas of the Antarctic completely. I mean, to me, an iceberg was always a great big sharp thing that stuck out of the organ. About two thirds of the Earth's fresh water supply is estimated to be down here. Icebergs break off the ends of the glaciers as they push slowly down to the sea. Studies are being made to see how practical it would be to tow them to different parts of the world. Very difficult, I'd say. Lots of people have said, can we use icebergs for a source of fresh water, such as Western Australia or Southwest Africa or indeed Chile? One of these large tabulars could probably provide water for the whole of one year. Some of them are five or six miles wide or more. We placed uh, some instruments on top of several of these icebergs, and one of them at this moment is transmitting its course, speed, you name it, via a satellite to the Antarctic Institute in Norway. Research is going on all the time, and British scientific programs have been almost continuous in the Antarctic since 1925. The ice makes it impossible for ships to reach any of the bases for about eight months of the year. We can only get through between November and March, that's uh, summer down here. After that, the power of the ice is so great, even a modern ship would be crushed if it was trapped in it. Let go, let go. Rothera is an Earth Sciences Air Base of the British Antarctic Survey. You can't get much more isolated than the scientists here. We call on as many of the bases as possible, just to see if we can be of any help. There are numerous atmospheric stations throughout the Antarctic, and of course it is such a pure atmosphere. There's no pollution, there's nothing that gets in between us and the magnetosphere or the stratosphere or whichever sphere we're looking at. So one way or another, it is the most perfect natural laboratory. You can see mountains over a hundred miles away. Huskers are still used though they're not essential with today's mechanised transport. They're kept as much as anything so that the skills and experience of handling dogs won't be lost. There are two dog teams here at Rothera, and when they're not working, they're tethered well apart on a long chain, so they can't fight. They can be quite vicious, not with us, but with each other. They're very affectionate to man. Lovely dogs. <laughs> the skewers won't give you much affection. You'll get dive bombed. They do it to distract you from their chicks. The lowest temperature ever recorded, minus 88 centigrade, was in the Antarctic. Storms of 160 miles an hour and more can blow for weeks on end. It's supposed to be the most difficult place in the world, yet blokes are managing to live and keep working here all year round. Transport's made all the difference. Not that some of the locals appreciate that. It's all so much more reliable than it used to be, and unless the weather gets really bad, you can move around and get quite a lot done. For the Marines to get a bit of ski training in, these stokes are just about right. Providing you don't go over the edge. That'll teach you Marines to go skiing. Now, if you can just lift this, it doesn't hurt too much. All Navy ships have a good medical side. Even a small one like this has a hospital. Yeah. How's the pain? Yeah. Yeah. We'll complete the plaster in a few minutes. How's that feel? All right. The separation is difficult once you're married. That is the most difficult, the separation from wives and children. You have to go back and restart a marriage every so often. But you don't get mail for three or four weeks sometimes, and then it's a month old. Sam, you've replied to it. She's getting a reply to a question she asked five weeks ago, and she doesn't know what you're on about. She's forgotten all about it. Cloud-based, lowering very quickly. Surface temperature will be about minus one degrees C. 
That's going to give us um, cloudy, overcast conditions, snow, warnings of low stratus, turbulence, icing, and gales. Severe icing and severe turbulence. The wind can be 10 miles an hour in one place. If you round a corner, it's 80 or 90. And that could be bad news for a helicopter. Hurricane force wind, certainly. Hurricane is 64 and over, where we've had 64 and over for quite a lot of the afternoon. Gusting force 12. They don't go any higher. <laughs> Icing's always a problem, especially on the flight deck. You can't operate with it like this. The only thing that shifts its steam. The charting of this part of the world is very poor indeed. We are doing our best to improve it while we're down here. You have quite exciting moments as an officer of the watch. You might be in 100 meters, suddenly the bottom will come up to meet you. Stand by. Fix. On the right, 9255. Uh, the ship ran aground here last year. That's why we're drugging. You can get to an area and find a massive berg in the way. Miles of it. You don't know what's underneath, and eventually, when it moves away, there'll be a large area not charted. So we try to get as close as we can for the soundings. Stand by, fix 7000. Stand by. Fix. On the right, 9762. Starboard 10. Starboard 10. Starboard 20. Starboard 20. 20 still we going, sir. What's the next fixed unit? Midships. Midships. It's 7500, is the next fix. Stand by. 10. 7500. 10 approval, sir. 20. 20. 20 approval, sir. Midships. Midships, sir. Here's the midship, sir. Yeah, we're just 75 meters off. Stand by. Stand by. Yeah, one one zero. Stand one one zero, sir. Stand by. Fix seven two five zero. Stand by. Fix on the right nine seven seven eight. Fix one zero six. I stay one two one. Stand by. Fix on eight thousand. Stand by. Fix on the right nine four one five. Right. Stand by. Fix on nine thousand. East to ten. We're still going to be on right for line. Well. Stand by. Fix. Full stand. This is when the old goal needs to keep going. It's hardly the place to knock the bottom out. There you go, Knox, mate. You've got to get your keelers in that. <laughs> Next one, then. Let's have you. Most ships make these to leave as mementos in ports or various bases that they visit. The plan this evening will be to try and get into Faraday. And if we can't get to Faraday, we may well have to go to the American base at Palmer. The visibility, as you can see, is only about 200 meters at the moment. But there are many more bergs and a little bit of pack ice getting into Faraday, and probably virtually none on the way into Palmer. Right. The Americans have an extensive research program in Antarctica. We're here and basically showing the flag. Support work, take stores in. They always make us very welcome. Mind you, we can be useful. Shifting stores, airlifting scientists, the places are difficult to get at. We can save them a lot of time. Flying from 0900 to approximately 1615. I'll take off position 330 Claude Point at three nautical miles. Aim of this morning's flying then to offload the Joint Service Expedition stores 434 will be the first aircraft off, 500 pounds of fuel, 36 minutes endurance at 5309, requiring 12 knots over the deck, please. And of course, in this job, where you're actually doing some work rather than just exercising, there is a need to get it done, and because of that, there is pressure. Simply, the ship is away for seven months of the year. It takes two months to get down here and two months to get back. And if you get down to the Antarctic and you can't do the job, you're effectively wasting seven months. They put a lot of work in, but they can be lowering boats at midnight to get surveying parties back that have been stuck on islands, and they put the hours in. If the work's got to be done, it's got to be done. We haven't got a choice in the matter. If the pilots can fly for 10 hours, and 10 hours need to be flown, then they'll do it. If there's work to be done on the engine room, and the engineers have got to work all night, they'll do it. If the electricians have got to work all night, pump, the electronic side's gone, it will be done. It's got to be done, because we've got to be a unit that's capable of moving all the time. And we all know it, and we all accept it. We've worked hard, but we've played hard as well. If you can get the work done and enjoy yourself at the same time, you've got a happy ship going for you.
for the lads, they work hard, long hours sometimes, but when they get the time off, they go out and they know how to enjoy themselves and nobody can tell them. You can enjoy yourself anywhere, it's up to you. We get the job done despite the problems. That can be an achievement in itself. The great charity lift's about to come in. The heaviest lift, the farthest south in the whole world. For the peanut board. For the peanut board, yeah. What's the total sponsorship? Enough to cover the cost of a bed. That's about 300 pounds. 300 pounds? That's bloody good, actually. That's the bed costs 180 there, doesn't it? Okay, give it to me. Nice and good one, nice and good one. That's right. Back a bit. Get out of there, one. Back a bit, back a bit. A bit more. That's it, that's it. Keep her there. Keep her there. Keep her there. Okay, give it to me. Back a bit. 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 Back a Some of the remote bases are abandoned. The penguins have taken this one over. The thing about the Antarctic, it's got all the potential for international cooperation to really work. The one thing that I like about it, all the major nations have a representation. The Americans have rarely only two stations, McMurdo and Palmer. We have four and the fifth in South Georgia with a lot of field parties. The Argentines have nine, I think, but they're mostly military and the Chileans have several too. Some nations see it purely from a territorial point of view, whereas for others, it's genuine scientific research. It's a fantastic continent, and if the development of it's managed properly, then it has a great deal to offer. It is incredible. You feel you'd like to protect it somehow from being sport by pollution and things like that? It's a strange feeling as you leave. You look back. It's unique. South Georgia was the world's greatest whaling centre up to the early part of this century. The fjords teemed with whales. Now it's nothing. The whaling stations abandoned. Ghost towns. Whalers eventually pulled out in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So the stations here are now in their 20th year of disuse. Uh, some of them may have been kept going a little longer. They were production lines of slaughter. The ramp that the whales were dragged up was known as the Gates of Hell. The whaling stations themselves were vast communities. In one station in South Georgia, there were about 3,000 in the base itself. They were well paid, the men. There were lots of appalling industrial accidents involving hot fluids, hot fats, 12-hour days. They would do that for six months. Occasionally, they would get the odd Sunday off if there were no whales about. Most of them were Norwegian. It's as if one day they were working and the next, they just walked out, left everything. Not that it mattered. No one would come here in the winter uh, and they'd be back next spring. But the whales had been overexploited. It wasn't worth hunting them anymore. The whalers never returned. Not everyone from here went home. Some were famous, some not so famous. The elephant seal was almost seen off by hunters, but it survived. The males can weigh as much as four tons. Their breath is absolutely terrible. The Joint Services Expedition has been in South Georgia for the last six months. We're taking them off. The penguins can't wait to get in on the act. It's the activity that fascinates them. They are delightful creatures. They stick together, they do not run away from you, and that's sadly why the penguin is so vulnerable to man in that he befriends man. He just walks up to you and had this one follow me for about 300 yards. It was just he was interested.
there is talk in some countries of harvesting penguins for meat. If there is an industry in penguins, penguin meat, then there'll have to be some sort of control or the penguins will end up like the whales. From South Georgia, it's north to the Falklands. Endurance has been the guardship for the Falkland Islands for over a decade. Port Stanley was once a thriving settlement, repairing and resupplying sailing ships that had struggled to round Cape Horn, some unsuccessfully. That was a hundred years ago. Now it's a peaceful backwater in the South Atlantic. It's the end of March. Within days, the tranquility of these islands would be swept away. The Falklands would be in turmoil. But at this moment, no one here was aware of that. The trip's just about over. From here, we head north, homeward bound. Today's priority is winning the Stanley Shield. Every year we play for it. The slope on the pitch feels like one in three when you're running on it. The wind cuts you in half. Even the locals watch from inside their cars. For the lads, it's brass monkeys all round. Endurance won 6-4. Well done, lads. One thing that's very important, you must come back next season and defend it. <laughs> At the end of this very day, events in the South Atlantic were to change it all. Endurance was ordered south into battle. It was a journey that became an epic. But that's another story. You don't appreciate it until you've been... To actually have seen its colours, its contrast, it's an incredible journey. It was a one chance in a lifetime for me. It's a fantastic experience, one that I'll never forget. I wouldn't have missed it for the world.